And that now is what again, specifically? There is nothing uh, in the Ohio Constitution that prohibits the five members of the apportionment board to come together to create administrative rule for the process that they're going to undertake to apportion the state that adheres to the best practices found in those pieces of legislation. So if you were one of those five members, I would, how would you go, how I would you go about for that. convincing the other four? Well, I've already sent out, a, I sent out a pledge. I've asked everyone to pledge to that. And what's in that pledge? That exactly what I told you. I've got that. If you would like a copy of the letter, I can get it to you. I mean, what you referred to county line rule? There, yes, there's a, a that was part that's been part of the discussion. There's a county line rule that that is that is in the constitution that you would adhere to county line rules as best as possible. You know the way we've grown and changed; it hasn't always occurred. But that is that is definitely in the constitution. I guess not. Yeah. So, an ideal world, how would you? Draw, you know. Well, there are things that have to be. You you have to if you're gonna if you're gonna if you, if you're going to use a partisan performance index, you have to agree on how you calculate the partisan performance index, and then you have to agree on if you're going to use some a parameter like which is somewhat controversial is communities of interest. What how do you define a community of interest? This is called administrative rulemaking. This is this is you know there there are ways to get you can do it do it administratively and you can do it legislatively. This way, certainly legislatively, and having something before the voters and changing the Constitution to make this more prescriptive and less political it is a smart way to do it, but we've lost our opportunity to do that. So, you know, casting about looking for ways to get some of the best practices in there, uh, we can do this if we've got agreement amongst those people um, on the abortion report. Hmm. There's, you know, the part, it, it, I don't know whether you read all the, the bills and the, the guts of all the bills. But there's uh, there's um, an opportunity to take a look at the at the state and balance it out using partisan performance indexes. Make sure that we've got it, the most amount of competitive districts within the state. We, we, you know, you take that index and you say it's within the 50 to 52 percent range. Well, I, I, I haven't then, heard of that index. What? <clears throat> how is that developed, or who who, who is advocating that? That was in the Tom Letson bill, House Bill 260. No. No, that's wrong. 260 is the. Is it 260? 15. It's a Letson bill. Mm -hmm. and, and what does it say it's specifically that uh, makes it less partisan? <clears throat> well, what it does is it takes the. These, it, it, it balances out the state to make sure that there's no one political party has a partisan uh, uh, advantage by looking at competitiveness and compactness and communities of interest by mm -hmm. doing this all together. When you have a place. It's primarily democratic. You have to mirror that with the place that's primarily Republican. If that can't be done by you know breaking things up I see. Uh, it, into unusual looking districts, that's why the compactness has to come in. Okay. But it, you know that's been it, it's been masterful. And actually, there has been a test on this. A model was done by uh, Secretary of State Jennifer Bruner on on the congressional lines, and she did a did a competition, and uh, they applied some of these practices in there, and uh, and you can. Find that I believe it's available on our website. Thank you. What do you, what do you think of Golden Week? Golden Week. Yeah. Well, in the spirit of compromise between the two uh, uh, um, election reforms bills, I believe it's going to go by the wayside, and I think we're going to see a reduction down to 21 days. You support uh, that? Our 35-day election cycle. I, I support giving that up, but I think that it's something that's done in other states and in the future. As long as we can make sure that people understand that it's secure, it may come back. But I support that going away. When you think about Oregon style voting of people voting by mail, I think it's great for Oregon, and I like that. I like what's going on as far as the vote by mail right now. But uh, we have to be very cognizant of the fact that we are a very diverse state. We are not Oregon, and <clears throat> we have very rural areas uh, and very densely urban areas, and many many points of urban population uh, throughout, <coughs> throughout the state that makes it makes our state very different. So uh, so we need to not. Um, we need to take these types of changes and be very judicious and prudent in their application. I don't believe that our early voting has, has yet to settle in completely. I think we're seeing the change and shift uh, in, in the early voting process. Uh, is, you know, we haven't gotten to the point where, we, we, where we've hit the entire uh, watermark on that. So, so I think we need to take a go slow approach. Uh, it, it's worked well for Oregon, but uh, again, we have to make sure that what we've got in place works for, on behalf of the voters of Ohio. Um, 
I think that we need what to What works sure. well about it for her, and you say it works well for them, what, what, what specifically are you well, alluding to that you think does work well for them? What does it do? Well, I think, it, 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 I think there's a significant cost reduction mm -hmm. if you're doing vote by mail. And there's also that ease, which, which I know a lot of people like with our vote by mail right now, that ease, uh, the, the less um, time constraint when you're voting in person, you get to be at home, you get to have all the information that you, can, that you need to make an sure. informed choice, and you get to vote the, the entire ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you're not disenfranchising people. We still have a significant amount of population that are traditional voters that want to go on election day. Anytime I ask this question when I go throughout the state, there's quite a few people who still put up their hands and say, I'd like to go on election day. It becomes, it's a community exercise. Sure. It's one of those neighborhood mm -hmm. things. My mom was a poor culture thing. And it was, yes. And, uh, you know, in, but we're seeing this continue diminution of that. I've talked to people who said that they sat in Cuyahoga County and had eight people come to vote because the rest of them were voting either in person earlier or by mail. So so I think we're in the midst of a shift and we need to, you know, any you, you need to take a go slow approach when we talk about continued things like that. But we also need to look at the way we're applying. <coughs> you know, understand that there are votes that are being thrown out because of technicalities in, in the way they're filling out their ballots. We have to make sure that that's clear, uh, simple, and easy to understand by the voter and by the elections worker who's receiving the ballot. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, provisional balloting that is used in the, in the way it was intended to make sure people have access to the ballot, not disenfranchise people. So we need to make sure that we're, we're being very careful in how we apply that. And I think that in that House Bill 260, it was reducing, it, it uh, reduced the amount of uh, times that a poll worker can uh, insist on a provisional ballot from 13 to or four, and uh, and in the ID rules, you know, I support ID rules, but I think it needs to be clear and easily understood. Uh, and again, we've created a, a bit of a confusing scenario with poll workers uh, when it comes to ID rules. So I think we can do that. Seeing that you're Secretary of State in the 2012 election, yes. Yes. and you get a phone call. There are kids that are lined up trying to cast a vote on a college campus and they've been there for eight hours. Yes. We've run out of, of ballots in Cleveland. How do you act and act now so that people don't lose their right to vote? Well, again, there needs you have to plan beforehand for all those, uh, those eventualities. And you know that in, in the law right now is a backup paper ballot process. So if one of the system fails, there is a backup system. That is, that's intended to reduce those long lines like what happened at Kenyon. I think they were there until yeah. 3 o'clock in the morning. And that was because there was no backup. There was no option. And there were only one or two machines, uh, uh, most of which were broken. I think at least one was broken. So, and so they had to bring in stuff uh, uh, from outside. Now, that allocation of resources is part of the settlement of the League of Women Voters versus Blackwell uh, that became League of Women Voters versus Bruner. Uh, they have to, the, the, the planning has to occur. Uh, and uh, we, we, you need to have the backup. Uh, so that we don't have uh, that. And you, yes, you have to act immediately, and those contingency plans have to be in place, but the proper planning to go in, in, into making a major uh, presidential election uh, work uh, it has to be in place, and it has to start right after this election. How much interaction have you had with Jennifer Bruner? I've known her for a long time. She was, uh, she was parliamentarian for the Democratic Party, and uh, and uh, I remember when she ran for judge, uh, and I remember when she came to me and said she was running for Secretary of State. Uh, so I know her well. Would you do anything differently than she's done? Or would well, yeah, I'm a different, I'm a different person. <coughs> you know, I'm, I have a different background. I have a different, uh, different skill set. Different, you know, I mean, there are things that make me different. I think that she's done a good job. Uh, but, uh, but I, I come from local government. And uh, you know, my she's a judge, so you can see she has a judicial de demeanor that uh, you know, that you know may help or hurt depending on the circumstance. What demeanor do you have? 